Okay. I need to see what time it is. Oh, it's not that late. I thought it was later than that. So apparently I'm teaching today. And um, here I am. <laughs> so I'm going to do a teaching today called, it's on battle testing. And um, I don't know how long ago, maybe a month or two ago, the Lord put in my spirit battle testing. And it just became very apparent to me that all of the aggravating and irritating and devastating things that we go through on a day-to-day -day basis is battle testing. He's testing us to see if we're where we're at and if we're ready to battle. And we need, if we're soldiers in the army of God, we need to be able to go to battle. So the only way that we learn how to go to battle is through battling. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay. So to be battle tested is to be combat proven, combat wise, tried in battle. In the military, soldiers are battle tested periodically to demonstrate their best maneuvers in battle. They are battle tested to prove what they have learned in previous training, to advance to their next rank, to determine if they are ready to go to war and fight. It is important to determine if they're safe to rely on and have the backs of their fellow soldiers. Will they be an asset or a liability? And it, it reminds me of that movie, Hacksaw Ridge. I don't know if all of you have seen that, but it's a really powerful movie. I don't even really watch movies, but that's like one of my favorite movies, and it really made an impact in my life and, you know, had me take a hard look at myself. Like, would I really even be anywhere near that in real life if it came down to it? Because I think that's how God wants us to be. Um, the guy's name, the main character's name was Desmond Doss. And the thing is, he already had his faith established. It was unwavering. God was number one, and he made a final decision on that before anything else occurred. He was solid in that. He had boundaries and restraints on what he would do and not do. His mind was made up, and he stood firm. So when it was time to perform under pressure, he was able to overcome and set self aside. And only because of this could he rescue those in need. He didn't doubt his mission, um, excuse me, doubt his mission on what God expected from him. He didn't become sidetracked by focusing on self or his superficial injuries. He didn't leave his brethren behind because of offense from previous encounters when he was abused and berated by them. He loved and rescued every one of them and was willing to die for them. He was an example of a true disciple. Our battle testing takes place in the mind. Um, if you go to Jeremiah 17, please. Now, this is God. Um, Jeremiah 17.10. He says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So, this is where God's at with testing us and what, you know, what he's looking for, what his strategy is to raise us up. Go to Zechariah 13, please. Zechariah 13, 9. I will bring, is everyone there? I will bring one third through the fire. We'll refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. So you've got to ask yourself, what do you desire? Do you desire to be a disciple? 
Do you desire to be a soldier in the army of God? Or do you desire just to be a carnal Christian and a pew sitter? That's something you have to decide within yourself because it's not just going to happen. A lot of things we just wait and see what happens and we have to actually take action and do something to make it happen or it's not going to happen. So disciples are soldiers who can fight and are willing to fight. They're willing to do whatever it takes because they remember what it was like without their kingdom citizenship. And they remain, remain humble and grateful for truth in a land of deception. Carnal Christians are pew sitters. They tend to prioritize their opinions above God's word, and they tend to gravitate only towards what is fun and pleasing to their flesh, even when serving God. Some spend their whole lives trying not to backslide, Offering, often wavering back and forth, but never seeming to get anywhere. And I don't want that for my life, and you shouldn't either. But unless you do something about it, that's where you're going to be. I mean, of course, everyone likes to have fun, and there's nothing wrong with having fun whatsoever. But a lot of the things that God has designed for you to do as part of your calling and purpose ain't going to be fun or what you feel like doing. But it doesn't matter. You do it anyway, and you don't like, measure if you're going to do things or not because it's fun or not. I mean, at least that's what I understand. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, please. And these all, everything that I'm sharing with you are things that mostly I have experienced and learned myself, so... Don't think I'm sitting up here telling everyone about themselves and I haven't, you know, experienced these things and been tried through many of them. Um, Mama Kate says, wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes. So if I can share my wisdom with you, then maybe you won't have to go through as much, or maybe it won't take as long for you to get to where you're trying to go. Um, 1 Corinthians thir uh, 3. Verse 10, Ten through 23. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed on how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So what is the battle testing for? to test our faith, to strengthen us? Do we really believe his word? Do we really trust him? James 1, please. Sorry, I'm saying please a lot. I think because I'm teaching Isaiah to say please and thank you, I now automatically say please after everything I say. So I guess I'm learning too. Um, James 1, 2. And I mean, I know we've never heard this before. Um, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any one of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Now, my understanding is a double-minded man 
in this because they're talking to Christians is someone that's led partly by God and partly by the voice of the stranger. So they got two minds going on and they miss a lot because they're not dis, um, discerning between the voice of God and the voice of the stranger. There's a quote from uh, Smith Wigglesworth, great faith is the product of great fights. So he was a powerful man. He had lots of wisdom. And I like, I like Smith Wigglesworth a lot. Well, I liked him. He's not alive anymore. To have faith requires trusting in God and believing his word. He puts us in situations that force us to trust him because we don't. Basically, we say we do. We do in certain aspects, usually areas where we didn't trust him, and now we do because he already proved that he's for real. But he's trying to show us we don't really trust him the way that we need to, and so work on this, work on that. How about this? What about that? And that's how he's getting through to us. So he uses our trials to prove his word in us. Uh, excuse me. He uses our trials to prove his word in us, which we say we believe. This is the increase of faith. You don't just have faith. You aren't born with it. You develop it through your journey of trials and miracles. Then you can share your experience of faith with others as they are going through their trials. We hold each other up when the other is weak or discouraged. Romans 5, 3. Uh, Romans 5, 3 through 4. And no, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation, tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Our Christ-like character should bring hope to others. You will be battle-tested whether you're a believer or not. The whole country was just battle-tested with the coronavirus big time to see where they're at. And many people dove headfirst straight into fear, even Christians. It's very sad. This trial exposed everyone and where they're at. Many Christians have failed their battle test and are still failing, not trusting God but living in bondage. It's our job to bring truth and hope to them and help pull them out of the fear because they're, they're like so stuck deep in it. I mean, they're driving around with a mask in the car by themselves. And they, I mean, they think that that's what they're supposed to do. And that you're nuts because you don't. Um, Abraham was battle tested. This is like, I guess because I have a small kid. Abraham's battle test is like one of my least favorite ones. I'm like, oh, oh I can't even. Um, in Genesis 22, you can go there, please. Ready? Genesis 22, 1. Now it came to pass that after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on, the, on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two, uh, two of his young man with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? 
And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, I hear I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on, that, on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and, was, and looked, and there was a, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So Abraham was tested by God. Not just a burnt offering of something he cared about, but a burnt offering of his own child. And, you know, the story makes it sound like he was just cool with it. and Like, okay. Like, go set your kid on fire. Sacrifice him. Eh, Okay. He's God. He can heal him and raise him from the dead when he's done. I mean, I guarantee that's not really how it went down when it was happening. I guarantee he was flipping out. But he had such faith that even if you, um, you don't have to go there, but in Hebrews eleven seventeen through 19, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who received the promises was offering up his only begotten son, It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. So imagine having such faith that when this happens, you can bust through all the voices of the stranger and say what God can do, which is well, God can raise him from the dead if I kill him and like believe that. Because that's the kind of faith that God's looking for us to have. God battle tests us to see where we're at and to show us where we're at. Um, if you go to First Peter 1. First Peter one. I don't know if that's right. Yeah, it is. Okay. First Peter one verse six. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. But wait a minute, it says if need be, so Apparently, God thinks these trials that we are going through are need be, or we wouldn't be going through them. Verse 7, that the gentleness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen? So what happens if you flunk your battle testing? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, you can go throughout the Bible and see many people that have been in battles and failed their battle testing. So really, it, it just depends on the, uh, the destruction you endure. But the bare minimum is it's a do-over, and you have to go around the mountain again. The Israelites kept going around the same mountain in the wilderness. The Bible says they were a stiff-necked and stubborn people. It took them 40 years to do an 11-day journey. I don't want to be like that. If you go to Deuteronomy 1. All right. Deuteronomy 1, verse 1. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel on this, this side of the Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain opposite of Suf, 
and between Paran, Tafel, Laban, Hazareth, and Dizab. It is 11 days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Sir to Kadesh, Barnea. Now it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given them as his commandments to them. After he killed Sihon, king of Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who dwelt at the Astaroth in Edurai, on this side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moab, Moses began to explain this law, saying, The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the mountains of the Amorites, to all the neighboring places in the plain, in the mountains and in the lowland in, excuse me, in the mountains in the lowland, in the south, and on the seacoast, to the land of the Canaanites, to Lebanon, and as far as the great river, the Euphrates. See how I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. So the Lord said, enough, get off the mountain. <laughs> Go. Um, Jonah just straight up ran from his battle testing and God put him on timeout in a whale. Now, I, you know, things now are, it's the ministry of the Spirit, so I don't think he's going to be throwing you in a whale anytime soon, but, you know, it's for a foreshadow or symbolic of, of the ministry of the Spirit after Jesus. He might not throw you in an actual whale, but, but you might get locked up in a spiritual whale running from God. That's de definitely some kind of stronghold, and I wouldn't want it infl inflicted upon me. So check your battle stance and fortify, because no one's going to do it for you. And like I said, it doesn't just happen. You have to evaluate where you're at and what you're doing. And if, if the devil is tormenting you, torment him back harder. Don't just get him off or kick him off. Fight. Find your counterattack. Establish your battle stance in the mind and fortify. We know what the enemy hates. We know the weapons. The word says we know all things. We don't just try to stand up when he knocks you down. You knock him down when he approaches you every time. You're dealing with supernatural forces and you need supernatural weapons. We're primarily battling emotions. Emotions tempting you to get out of position and sow some destruction upon yourself. The battle is in your mind. Is your thought life corrupted? It's up to us to seek out thoughts that are not lining up with God's word and cast them down. The number one strategy to fight the en enemy is to get grateful. Have a grateful heart and give thanks to him verbally multiple times a day. Get grateful. Gratitude should be the foundation of your perception. This should be your battle stance. 99% of the time when someone is in torment or struggling, they have lost gratitude for what God has done in their life. Excuse me. You were rescued and you're not in hell. I mean, really, there's nothing, no matter how good we are, that orchestrated that to happen. It was a miracle. All we did was cry out to God at some point in, in uh, our weakest point of desperation, and we humbled ourselves, and that's how God likes us best. We should be the happiest people on earth because we're not going to hell. If you want increase in your anointing, be thankful and get grateful. Daniel was very grateful and thankful. If you go to Daniel 6.10. Daniel was aggressively thankful. He bowed down three times a day, gave thanks verbally. Even though he knew his door could be kicked in and be, he could be thrown into a lion's den over it. But it was that serious to him. So in Daniel 6.10 it says... Now when Daniel knew that the writing was a sign, he went home. 
And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Moses battled. You don't think Moses dealt with idiots? <laughs> At one point in Moses' life, he was so fed up with idiots that he prayed, if God really loved him, then God would kill him as a sign of compassion. That's in Numbers eleven fifteen. It says, if this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. If I had found favor in your eyes, and do not let me face my own ruin. I would say he was fed up. He was battling. Joseph battled. He was thrown down a well by his own brothers. He, he was taken into slavery. He battled for seven years. He faced the enticement of lust from Potiphar's wife. False accusations. He faced prison. And several other are you kidding me's. And he never turned from God. Job battled. He battled harsh. He lost everything. He didn't even do anything wrong. Yet he lost his houses, his riches, his cattle, even his own children. He was plagued. Yet he still chose to praise God for his goodness. Job recognized that everything he had in life came from the hand of the Lord. If God chose to take that away from him, then who was Job to complain? He had to deal with accusatory friends and even his own wife who told him to give up on God and die. However, Job continued to maintain his trust in the faithfulness of God. David battled many times, King David. He went from tending sheep and battling Goliath to recruiting and training an army of well over a million men, the best of the best. They were described as mighty men of valor, experts of war with all instruments of war who could keep rank and were not double, of double heart. And that's what God's calling us to be. And of course, Jesus battled many times. He had 40 days in the wilderness dealing with ornery disciples. He even prayed so hard that he sweat blood. He got the, on the cross, he got the keys back from hell, and his Holy Spirit has been covering the earth and fighting our battles and battles against the enemy for almost 2,000 years. And he wants us to battle too. Can you go to 1 Peter 4.12, please? First Peter 4.12. This is another one that we hear all the time, but it's so appropriate. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened. I think another strong point in our battle stance should be Stop getting so surprised when the battle comes. Like the surprise factor should be taken out because we know it's coming. And if we don't get so surprised, then we'll be able to be calm and hear the voice of God and decide what to do. So I have uh, some examples of the most common stumbling blocks that will cause you to flunk your battle testing and strategies to bust through. Obviously, this isn't every single issue and strategy, just some ideas. But point being, get with the Lord for tactics better suited to whatever you're going through. Um, the first most common stumbling block is a mouth of failure. It says somewhere in there that your throat is an open tomb. And that scripture really is like imprinted in my 
spirit always when I first read that. Because it's so true. When we get in a bad place and we just unleash the beast, it's like an open tomb. It stinks and there's so much evil coming out of there. And all we're doing is sowing destruction upon our lives. Grumbling, complaining, talking crap about others, profanity. It took the Israelites 40 years to make an 11-day journey, mainly because they were not grateful and their mouths were full of grumbling and complaining. People who can't keep their mouth in order are continually flunking their battle testing. The Lord showed me, living like this gets you a free season pass on the emotional roller coaster because you're just yakking away and then you have to live out what you've said. So battle stance strategy for this is get grateful and shut up. Sow and speak life. Confess and decree the word and use your mouth as an altar for God and praise him in whatever storm you're going through. So I think that's the most common stumbling block that we all get ourselves in unnecessary torment and flunking our battle testing is we just let the mouth go. Another one, especially for people in the program, is being over-emotionally bound to our children or loved ones. There's a fine line when people become an idol in our lives. God is a jealous God and he wants to be number one priority. And when people get in the way of this, he will shut it down. The enemy uses this to distract you or affect you emotionally in a negative way. When people you love become idols, it will cause you to fail your battle testing. Battle stance strategy. We choose to cast our cares upon him and let him care for us. We surrender our unsaved loved ones. We commit them into God's hand every time the enemy tries to make us go there. We sever the emotional attachments daily. I'm 99% sure he isn't going to expect us to go through what Abraham went through with our children. But we're still supposed to cast our cares and worries upon him and leave them on the altar just the same. My husband says, I'm allowed to worry when God worries, which is never, so. (laughs) Another um, one of the most common stumbling blocks that will cause you to flunk your battle testing is things happening out of your control or not going your way or hating authority. Trying to force our false agendas, our carnal... Excuse me. Our carnal nature hates authority, which is why it's so good for us to have to submit to it. It keeps our flesh in check. I learned early I can either keep my own flesh in check privately or God will do it openly. We respect God's divine order. When we obey that compulsion to jump out of order, you do not trust God. And that is a surefire open door. Breaking rank is an automatic flunk in the battle testing. Pretty much every dumb thing we do is because of fear and anxiousness. Battle stance strategy. We must make a final decision to stay in order no matter what. Be ready in season and out. Submit to God and then you can resist the devil. Deny self, pick up cross, follow, in other words, die. Three letter word. Humble yourself and let God exalt you. We shut our mouths and refuse to grumble. We find our God-given parameters and stay in there. They're the boundaries. And that's what God is talking about when he talks about the secret place of the Most High. It's the boundaries that God has created to us where we find shelter and safety under the covering of his wings. And when we come out of the boundaries that God has established for us, we get spanked. Or worse. Another most common stumbling block that will cause you to flunk your battle testing is having to deal with someone that has Jezebel or narcissism, Jezebel narcissist personality. And 
there, our whole country is like under this, you know, it's rampant. And if we don't learn, we have to learn how to overcome the Jezebel narcissist or we will continually stumble. It's one of the main spirits trying to take over this country, probably even the world. And if you can't figure out how to handle and deal with a Jezebelic narcissist, it will send you in a tailspin every time. If another person's behavior can affect us so deeply, then something is off within us regardless of how awful they are. So your battle stance strategy is love the person, forgive them daily, if need be, daily, but stop touching and agreeing with the demon. Stop bowing. We choose not to be entangled with the affairs of this world. Love them from afar, if need be. Warfare against it every day. And here's a big one. Choose not to be offended no matter what. Because offense changes your citizenship immediately. It pushes you and harasses you to step out of position. So there's a tool for every situation. And you can either choose to have a, a victim mentality and stay a pew sitter and try not to backslide every day. Or you can bust through and keep it moving. Because the devil's not going to stop because you got your feelings hurt or because something happened that wasn't right. Things happen that aren't right all the time. People mistreat people. Um, you know, I've heard many times people share their testimony and say how much more difficult it is to deal with Christians once they got saved than it was worldly people. There's a lot of rough people that you got to deal with. And we got to learn how to stand strong and not use it as an excuse to run back to the world or an excuse for our misbehavior. There's always going to be an excuse to not listen to God. It, the excuses will keep coming and coming and coming no matter what. <laughs> Another um, area where we will fail our battle testing is mental torment, offense, Self-pity, oppression, fear, anxiety, victim mentality, and jealousy. Which often happen after or if you have to deal with somebody. I mean, in my life, I don't know about you guys, but I have so many people that have the whole Jezebelic narcissism thing going on that I have to deal with. And um, these things usually follow. Mental torment, offense, self-pity, oppression, fear, anxiety, victim mentality, the first thing the, tri the devil tries to strip when offense comes is your gratitude. And all these things gain access once your gratitude fortress, you allow your uh, gratitude fortress to fall. Like, we need to have a gratitude fortress. Like, you can't come in here. I'm grateful, and I'm not going to be not grateful no matter what. So the counterattack, because once you're already in these things, you need a counterattack. You don't just pray. You need to, like, counterattack and push that thing out and kick it out. We praise and worship. We speak, decree, and confess the word. Fight and cast down the thoughts. And the Lord showed me a couple weeks ago, God will use the fear from the enemy to make us brave. So what... The enemy means for bad, God will turn to good. And at every battle that we overcome and face the fear and do what is right, God's going to strengthen us. Every time you face your fear and choose righteousness in the face of fear, you level up and you will become stronger and more refined. Another area where it's common for people to fail their battle testing is self-preservation, attention-seeking, and the need for praise and accolades. There's nothing more ridiculous than an attention-seeking adult. I mean, that's not in the Bible or anything. That's just my personal opinion. It, I mean, come on. <laughs> so, battle stance strategy is 
Deny self, pick up cross, and follow. Humble yourself, be quiet, and let someone else have the spotlight. We promote Jesus, not self. We can do nothing without him, and every good thing that comes out of us is from him. So when you get in this loneliness, need for attention, need for praise, no one sees how good I'm doing, all of these thoughts are pride. So even though pride is an ugly word, and they seem little and innocent, it's still pride, and God doesn't like it, and it's going to cause you to flunk your battle testing. Another area, especially in the ministry, when people are staying in the program, is uh, finances, fear of finances, lack of finances, overwhelming debts, um, being annoyed about how much they have to pay rent, whatever it is. It's finances and the love of money is the root of all evil. It's going to cause you to stumble. It says, excuse me, the Bible says the love of money is the root of every evil thing. So we're not supposed to love it. So the battle stance strategy for that would be give all you have to the poor. (laughs) Bless others. Give offering out of your lack. If you don't have money, give away something you really like. Give away your favorite sneakers or whatever, you know. You have to parent your flesh. We train our flesh to bow to us. We don't bow to our flesh. True disciples are givers, not takers. We shouldn't always have our hand out for others to bless us, but we should start to bless them. And this will cure your fear of lack and your fear of finances if you do this, I promise. Because it's just stuff. And God's always going to take care of you. If God took care of you when you were out in the world smoking crack or whatever you were doing and ruining your life, how much more is he going to take care of you when you're committing your life to the Lord and worshiping him and doing what he's called you to do? And of course, the final one that comes to mind in dealing with um, flunking your battle testing is lust for another mate. Um, it's, if it's not from God, who's it from? And it's that simple. I mean, after reflecting a long, hard time on my own life before Christ, it was clear that, to me that the wrong mate will mess you up way worse mentally than any drug. Ungodly soul ties are no joke. These people will get in your dreams, be popping up in memories 20 years later. Even the right person at the wrong time will mess you up. So your battle stance strategy for this is keep your eyes on him. Stay vertical. We don't need to be horizontal so much. Vertical. And then he'll lead you where you need to be. Establish higher standards. Don't play with the devil and just say no to the thoughts. Stay in the boundaries. If you go out of bounds, you will get hurt, 100% guarantee. Maybe not today or even tomorrow. It might be two years from now, but it's coming. It reminds me of playing with a cat, like you have the little string. You're playing with the cat, and it's so cute, and everyone's having fun, and then all of a sudden, before you know it, it's like, (coughs) and it like claws you and starts biting you, and you're bleeding, and You thought it was fun, but it's dangerous. You got to stop it. Everyone. My cat does that to me. Like, I think it's great, and then all of a sudden it's not. So these are the areas that are some of the most common ones that will cause us to flunk our battle testing. And I mean, it's all fun and games. I'm just joking it's not you know but it's serious I mean you can laugh about it but it's serious it's all fun and games until someone gets hurt which is what I meant to say um 
So those aren't the only things that we face, of course, but those are some of the most common ones. And you can do the same thing when it comes to whatever you're battling. Find out from God what you can do to counterattack it. Don't just sit there and let it happen and dwell in it and be, like, allow the devil to make you miserable. Be the warrior that God's called you to be. We must develop the capacity to fight the enemy aggressively. If you go to Romans 8, 37... It says, yet in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So how can we be more than conquerors unless we fight and win? You can say anything. You can even learn and know everything. It means nothing. God wants to see what you put into practice. What will you do? Will you fight in faith? Do you believe his word? Because his word says this. In Isaiah 40, uh, 43, 2. This is what God's word says. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned nor shall the flame scorch you. The battle testing is because he wants you to have guts. He's exposing your points of weakness to you. He expects you to do something about it for next time, like learn. <laughs> Mama Kate says wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes. This is great advice and ideal. However, we should at least be learning from our own mistakes. Being most of us here are those people that like to learn everything the hard way. Quit hanging out on that mountain with the Israelites. Not all the battles that Israel and God's people fought ended in victory. It was only when they obeyed the Lord and trusted God that they emerge victorious. In our own lives today, we face battles not on a field with swords and spears, but in our hearts and minds. We can only be victorious if we are obedient to what God has revealed to us. So many times people complain they aren't seeing victories in their life, yet they ignore the fact that they are not being obedient. In James 1, 2, and I'm almost done. No, excuse me, James 1.12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And then in Revelation 3.21. Now this is his promise. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. In Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we all come to you again and we thank you so much for your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, counsel, correction, and direction. And I just ask that you would help penetrate whatever parts of our being that needs to be penetrated by you this morning. And I ask that whatever was said here, that it would be edifying to people and help them to see what it is you've called them to be. I bind every power of darkness that tries to steal and strip our identity or distract us or bring offense or any kind of hindrance to stop us from your plan, Lord. And I just ask for your, your victory, your love, that overcomes all things, your understanding, your perception, your freedom, and your plan. And I ask that you would improve area, every area where we fall short, 
that you would strengthen every area that needs strengthening, settle every area that needs settling, and just help us to dwell with you and be confident in who you are and who you've called us to be and help us not to miss you. Help us to stop flunking our battle testing and help us to see things through your eyes. And we love you, Lord, and we give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.